as our story begins, a carriage of the Kent Constabulary races through the night. Its destination, a lonely, distant manor house. Upon their arrival, the police are shown to the site of a grisly crime. Sir Eustace Brackenstall lies dead upon his hearth rug, blood and brains spattered across the room. The case is one of murder. And so begins the adventure of the Abbey Grange. On Baker Street, Holmes rouses his friend Watson from slumber. Come, Watson. Come. The game is afoot. Hit your clothes and come. Being the initial episode filmed for the return of Sherlock Holmes, The Abbey Grange brought actor Edward Hardwick and producer June Wyndham Davies into the series fold for the first time. Davies, having enjoyed the stories as a girl, was already quite familiar with the great detective, even having gone so far as to have written a musical of The Hound of the Baskervilles in her younger years. To Peter Haining, she admitted that she was a bit intimidated at the prospect of taking over the show. She said, It was a great challenge to be asked to take over the series when it was already established and enormously popular and give it added impetus. But I am full of admiration for Jeremy Brett. He is such a caring actor and gives tremendous encouragement to all those around him. Sherlock Holmes has never had a better interpreter, in my opinion, and I think the pairing of Jeremy Brett and Edward Hardwick is superb, and they continue to evolve the characters in every story. In fact, to Helen Cohen and Baptiste Marcel, Davies recalled her part in the transition between Watsons. She said, I met David Burke when I was going to do The Return. He had just received a wonderful offer to go to Stratford Memorial Theater, and he came to me and said, this is terrible. You're going to take over, and I'm leaving, and it looks so bad. But one of the things I have done throughout my career is if an actor has a chance that is going to enhance his career, I never stopped him, and I never would. It was Edward Hardwick I chose to be Dr. Watson, and I actually believe he was better. David had a more modern approach and a more abrasive personality. Edward is, to me, the definitive Dr. Watson. He has everything that Conan Doyle speaks of. He is the most lovely actor to work with and a great personal friend. By train, Holmes and Watson travel to the scene of the crime. Well, I think we have thought sufficiently, Holmes. Splendid. Abbey Grange, Marsham, Kent, 3.30 a.m. My dear Mr. Holmes, I should be very glad of your immediate assistance in what promises to be a most remarkable case. There's something quite in your line. Except for releasing the lady, I will see that everything is kept exactly as I found it. But I beg you not to lose an instant, as it is difficult to leave Sir Eustace there. Yours faithfully, Stanley Hopkins. Ah. Inspector Hopkins. He's called you in seven times. On each occasion, his summons has been entirely justified. I fancy that every one of his cases has found its way into your collection. I must admit, Watson, you do have some part of selection. Thank you. It atones for much of which I deplore about your narratives. 
Your fatal habit of looking at everything from the point of view of a story instead of as a scientific exercise has ruined what might have been an instructive and even classical series of demonstrations. Why do you not write them yourself? I will, my dear Watson, I will. In my declining years. Edward Hardwick initially struggled to find his footing in the Abbey Grange, quite literally. To NPR's Leanne Hansen, Jeremy Brett recalled. Enough so that you're sure well, Ed was a very, very remarkable man. One, probably the nicest, one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And he wanted to fit in. So he watched the previous 13 films, decided to try and look a little like David Burke as much as he could, bless him. So he put on a rug, I mean a toupee, and, um, and put lifts in his heels. And the first film we shot together was The Abbey Grange. And we were running across a field. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he, of course, he, these heels were too high, so he was slipping and sliding. And I said, oh, Edward, take them out. I'll bend my knees for the rest of the film. <laughs> so that's how we adapted and healed it in. Peter Hammond, the director of the Abbey Grange, also provided Hardwick with some much-needed character direction, for which he was quite grateful. He recalled, The Abbey Grange was the first one I was involved in, and a director called Peter Hammond, who subsequently did a lot of them, um, did it, and he gave me a couple of notes which were hugely important to me, and they made a lot of difference to the way I looked at the part. There was a sequence in the Abbey Grange where Holmes is pacing around trying to work this thing out. And Hammond said to me, uh, I want you to smoke. And I, I said, yes, what? Smoke what? He said, cigarettes. I want you to smoke cigarettes. So I lit a cigarette. And he said, no, no, no. He said, keep the cigarette very close to your face. Don't move it away too far. And it doesn't really mean anything in, it, in its explanation, but in the context of what we were doing, it immediately made me think, yes, that suggests time and concentration. And it somehow triggered something in the back of my head that made me think, Watson, I don't know why, and I couldn't explain it to you. But I remember saying to Jeremy, I feel, before that happened, I, I remember saying to him, I feel I'm disappearing inside my costume. Arriving at the Abbey Grange, Holmes and Watson are met by Inspector Hopkins, who regretfully informs them that their journey has been in vain. The assailants have been positively identified by the lady of the house, Lady Brackenstall. Holmes, however, is dubious and troubled to find injuries on Lady Brackenstall, which she omitted in her initial statement. Nonetheless, the lady confides that her husband was a violent alcoholic. And with that, she begins her tale. I'll tell you about last night. Eustace retired at about half past ten. The servants had already gone to their quarters. Which are where? In the east wing. Only my husband, Teresa, and myself sleep in the central block. The servants would have heard nothing. Had you retired by then? I was in my room. I never retired till I've seen Madame to bed. Thank you. I sat up. This room, in fact. It is my custom to walk around to see that the house is secure. Because for obvious reasons, Sir Eustace is not always to be relied upon in that respect. But when she examined the dining room that night, she suddenly found herself face to face with an intruder. A big man, quite elderly. For a moment, we just stared at each other. Then two other men came in behind him, and he came for me. I must have been unconscious for some minutes. It was then that my unfortunate husband entered the room. They dealt with him, as you shall see. I believe I fainted again. I'm not sure. The exact events are difficult. 
I drifted in and out of consciousness, you understand. I do know that they cleared the room of its silver and they must have drawn themselves a bottle of port, some of which I saw them drink. The man who struck me was elderly with a beard. The others younger, smooth-faced. Yes. Finally, they checked that I was securely bound and left, taking the silver with them. How was the alarm raised? Madam had not come upstairs. Earlier she said she would follow me shortly, so at midnight I went down in case she'd fallen asleep over a book. A thing I hate to do. And there I found her, poor lamb, just as she says. And him on the floor, his blood and brains all over the room. Enough to drive a woman out of her wits, and her gagged and bound, and her very dress spotted with him. She never wanted courage, did Miss Mary Fraser of Adelaide. And Lady Brackenstall of Abbey Grange hasn't learned new ways. The graceful Lady Brackenstall was played here by Australian-born actress Anne Louise Lambert. Born in Brisbane in 1955, Lambert found her first acting work in Sydney, appearing in various television soap operas. Her big break came in 1975 when legendary director Peter Weir, after seeing Lambert in a TV commercial for Fanta Soda, decided that she would be perfect for the lead role in his next film, A Picnic at Hanging Rock, a film that would become a major cult classic. She would go on to play many starring roles in both film and television, including The Borgias, The Draftsman's Contract, and House of Hancock. And she was originally cast as Princess Irulan in David Lynch's 1984 sci-fi epic, Dune, but was replaced at the last moment by actress Virginia Madsen. But Lambert continued to work steadily, and in 2004, she appeared in Somersault, a picture which won Best Film at the 2004 Australia Film Institute Awards. Around this time, Lambert turned her attention to another field, psychotherapy, and she currently resides in the Sydney suburb of Balmain, working primarily as a psychotherapist, life counselor, and coach at the age of 65. In the dining room of the Abbey Grange, Watson examines the body of Sir Eustace. That's a blow of savage ferocity. A single blow? I believe so. It is a straightforward enough wound, you see. It begins thus, below the ear, and then crosses both spheres of the parietal bone at such an angle that this side is smashed as far as the coronal suture. I've, I've never seen anything like it. A powerful man, this Elder Randall. Half his trade is violence, sir. And he certainly left his trademark. What beats me is how Randall could do so mad a thing. Knowing that the lady could describe them and that we could not fail to recognize the description. The criminal mind has its quirks of conscience and scruples. In that respect, it is as individual and curious as any other. A noted miser may be secretly charitable, so this violent Randall may draw the line at the murder of an unconscious woman. Or he may well believe that she did not see him. Well, how is that, sir? She testifies that they stared at each other. Yes, but it was she who held the light. What Randall may have seen was mostly flickering candle flame. The face behind it, a distorted mask. He may have been unimaginative enough to have thought that she saw no more than he did. He knocked out unconscious at the next instance, thus for his purposes, solving his problem, Watson. May I impose upon you to search the turkey rug? What for, Holmes? Candle wax, Watson. Candle wax. Holmes turns his attention to the service bell, a curious rope which was seized to bind the female victim. 
but Watson draws Holmes' attention back to the carpet. A scattering of wax and a very light scorching. Invisible, but leaving its characteristic scent. The lady would have fallen here. Brand would have snatched up the candelabra immediately. I suppose that is where they took their refreshment. Uh, to steady their nerves, yes. Uh, port wine, sir. Did Lady Brackenstall say that the butler's corkscrew was used? No, sir. She was senseless at the moment the bottle was opened. Quite so. It was opened with a pocket screw, probably contained in a knife. If you examine the top of the cork, you will observe that the screw was driven in three times before the cork was extracted. This long screw would have transfixed it and drawn it with a single pull. When you catch this fellow, it is likely that you will find that he has a multiplex knife in his possession. Excellent, Mr. Holmes. These three glasses do puzzle me, I must confess. Did Lady Brackenstall say that she actually saw the three men drinking? Oh, yes. She was clear about that, sir. Well, then there's an end of it. What more is to be said? Michael Cox was largely pleased with the outcome of this installment of the series. But in his book, he did air a number of caveats to his praise. He wrote, The initial investigation of the scene of the crime is embellished with a demonstration of how high a light held in front of the face may blind an observer to what is behind it. I am afraid that this is not very convincing and much prefer the traditional investigation of the bell rope and the bonds for which it was used. Jeremy scales the fireplace in fine style, but unfortunately, the camera angle reveals some modern electrical wiring that should not be there. The turning point in this case is, of course, Holmes' observation of the sediment in the third wine glass. Conan Doyle called it beeswing. We called it crusting. I have never found it a very persuasive clue, but perhaps that is because I seldom drink port. On the train back to London, Holmes has an epiphany. And as they arrive at their destination, they immediately secure passage back to the scene of the crime. Watson, we have been dazzled out of observation by that lady's beauty. Beauty may be truth, but she does not necessarily speak it. There was port in each glass, but there was only crusting in one glass. Mm last glass filled is the one most likely to contain the crusty. I agree, if the last pouring had approached the bottom of the bottle, but the bottle was half full and it had been agitated. The crusting was present throughout the port. Mm. Well, what then do you suppose? That only two glasses were used and that the dregs of both were poured into a third so as to give the false impression that three people were there. I understand. If I'm right, Watson, then in an instant, this case rises from the commonplace to the exceedingly remarkable. That will be the Kentish train. What will? That will. How on earth did you hear it? I heard nothing, Watson. I observed. Back at the Abbey Grange, Holmes and Watson conduct their own investigation. And in a nearby ditch, Holmes spies a strange artifact, the broken tombstone of a pet dog named Fudge. Fudge. Lady Brackenstall's pet dog, let us imagine, dies. It may not be too fanciful to suggest that the poor unfortunate creature was literally killed. Killed? For what reason? Reason, I suggest, hardly entered into it. It was done in a fit of insane rage. By whom? By a drunken, sadistic ruffian. One of the murderers? No, Watson. The lady's husband. The last of the Brackenstalls. Brackenstall? Consider it. 
No one but a member of the household could vandalize a gravestone and have remained in place. Why should Brackenstall entertain such an obsession about a pet animal that he will forbid any remembrance of it? You saw the marks, of course, on the lady's arm. Yes, I was surprised that they did not interest you more. There were stab wounds made by a long needle or a hat pin. This lady has been living in fear of her physical safety, Watson. Back in the dining hall, Holmes leaps into action, climbing atop the fireplace mantel to re-examine the hook of the missing bell rope. His eyes widen as he realizes he had missed a vital clue. Unlike the frayed rope that was used to bind the lady's hands, the edge remaining on the hook was cut clean. We have got our case. How nearly have I made the blunder of a lifetime? But now the chain is almost complete. You've got your men. Man, Watson. Man. <sighs> Only one. But a remarkable person. Strong as a lion, active as a squirrel, dexterous with his fingers, and finally, remarkably quick-witted. Confronting Lady Brackenstall, Holmes pleads with her to reveal the truth of her ordeal. But the lady stubbornly adheres to her story. I am convinced that you are a much tried woman. If you will trust me and treat me as a friend, you may find that I will justify that trust. What do you want me to do? To tell me the truth. Mr. Holmes! No, 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 please. Lady Brackenstall. It is of no use. You may have heard of any little reputation that I may possess. I will stake it all on the fact that your story is a complete fabrication. You're an impudent fellow. You try to say that my mistress has told a lie? Have you nothing to tell me? I have told you everything. No, think just once more, Lady Brackenstall. Wouldn't it be better to be frank? I have told you all I know. I am sorry. As Holmes and Watson depart the estate, Holmes takes note of a peculiar log in the lake, unmoved since their earlier visit. According to executive producer Michael Cox, the grounds of the Abbey Grange are a composite of three great houses on the south side of Manchester. Adlington, which had appeared before in the Speckled Band, Dunham Massey, and Tabley. Between them, they provided an imposing home for the Brackenstall family, which included a lake. Although, alas, it was not a frozen one as in the story. So instead of the presence of a mysteriously convenient hole in the ice marked by a solitary swan, the episode utilized a floating log, which did not move. Stopping at the offices of the Southern Cross Line, Holmes discovers the name of the singular crewman, both present on Lady Brackenstall's voyage from Adelaide and currently berthed in London, an honorable captain by the name of Jack Crocker. In his book, A Study in Celluloid, Michael Cox added a brief bibliographical note to his coverage of this episode pertaining to Captain Jack Crocker. He wrote, because I was brought up on the Strand magazine, and the early English reprints of the stories in book form, I always think of that first officer as Jack Croker, spelled C-R-O-K-E-R. So it was a surprise to hear Holmes refer to him in this film as Crocker, C-R-O-C-K-E-R. For some reason, this spelling was used in the American editions, and in the 1980s, we all had to get used to the American text of the stories, the Doubleday, complete Sherlock Holmes, 
which is also the basis of the Penguin Omnibus. That is now the most widely available version, and the edition which is used for reference by all who write about the canon. But for me, it will never replace the two-volume collected edition first published in this country by John Murray in 1928 and 1929. I vividly remember paying seven shillings and sixpence of carefully saved pocket money for a reprint of the short stories in their red cloth and yellow dust wrapper. That would be nearly 50 years ago, and that is still the edition I reach for first. Back at the Abbey Grange, the police follow a note from Holmes to drag the log from the lake. Tied to its underside, they find the stash of silver that was reportedly stolen by the Lewisham gang. Later, Holmes and Watson receive a visitor on Baker Street. Captain Crocker, sit down. I've got your telegram. I've come at the hour you said. I heard you've been down to the office. There's no getting away from you, is there? Speak up, man. You can't stand there and play cat and mouse with me. What do you know? Could you give him a scar, Watson. Please. Bite on that, Captain Crocker. And try not to let your nerves run away with you. I should not sit here smoking with you if I thought you were a common criminal. Tell me, what did you use to secure the silver to the floating log? I guess it was fishing gut from the gun room, but I was not present at its recovery. Am I right? What do you want? Justice. For whom? No, we are not partisan. We just want to see justice done, that is all. Very well. Was it fishing gut? No, tarred twine. It's a throwback to my days before the mast as a youngster. Even now, I always carry a silver coin, a length of twine, and, and a, a multiplex knife. How the devil do you know that? Now, give me a true account of everything that happened at the Abbey Grange last night. Be frank with me, and we may do some good. Play tricks with me and I'll crush you. Oh, Johnson. Well, one thing I'll say first, I regret nothing, I fear nothing, and I'd do it all again if I had to be proud of the job. Damn the man. Well, that's my side of things, only my side. When I think of Mary, sweet Mary Fraser, when I think of getting her into this bloody business, is that that turns my soul to water. Captain Crocker recounts first meeting Mary Fraser of Adelaide when he was first mate on the ship, the Rock of Gibraltar. Together, they danced the night away. And while she had only intended friendship, Crocker had fallen in love. But at the end of the voyage, they parted. So I never thought to see her again. The last voyage I was promoted and the new boat was not yet launched, so I had to wait for a couple of months with my people in Kent. I knew now where she was, but stayed away. But then I met Teresa Wright one day, and she told me all about her, about the marriage, about the man's drunken cruelty, about everything. Do you know this noble baronet burnt her pet dog and threatened as much to her? I tell you, gentlemen, it nearly drove me mad. I did meet Mary, and I met her again. At last, she would meet me no more. I was then given notice that I'd leave on my voyage within a week. In spite of the danger, he called upon her that night to bid her farewell. But their tender goodbye was interrupted by the arrival of Sir Eustace, who rushed like a madman into the room, screaming obscenities and striking Mary unconscious with a single blow. A confrontation 
ensued, which ended with Crocker landing a single strike with a fireplace poker, a blow that ended the life of Sir Eustace. To revive Mary and steady his nerves, he shakily opened the bottle of port and poured two glasses. Together with Teresa Wright, they concocted a tale to fool the police. Unrepentant, the captain looks to Holmes for his reaction. Teresa was as cool as ice. It was her plot as much as mine. We must make it appear the burglars had done the thing. Teresa kept on repeating our story to her mistress whilst I swarmed up and cut the rope of the bell. I then lashed her in her chair, frayed out the end of the rope to make it look natural. The silver, will you know about that? I do, and the third glass of port to tie in with the randles? Yes. And we dropped the candlestick by where Mary fell for the wax would splash, you know. I never thought the police could have seen through our dodge. When I knew that savage fiend was dead and she was free of him, I reckon I'd done the best night's work for my life. I still do, even if I swing for it. That is the truth. The whole truth, sir. Yes. Yes, you have told me the truth. And if the lady's maid had been less abstemious and had accepted your glass of port, your ingenuity might have fooled me as you have certainly fooled the police. What put you onto me? How on earth did you find me? No one could have got up to that bell rope but an acrobat or a sailor. No one but a sailor could have made the knots with which the cause was fastened to the chair. It was evident that the lady was shielding someone. To do so under such circumstances meant that she must love. Douglas. It was not too wild a leap of the imagination to connect her with an officer of the ship which brought her to this country. <sighs> Crocker. <laughs> you are expecting a visitor. Watson grants entrance to another guest, Lady Brackenstall. Crocker and Mary embrace and place their fates in the hands of Sherlock Holmes. Our intrepid Captain Crocker was portrayed here by Swiss-born actor Oliver Tobias. Born Oliver Tobias Treetog in 1947, Tobias came to the United Kingdom at the age of eight and immediately began his acting training at East 15 Acting School in London. By the age of 22, he was starring in, directing, and choreographing the rock opera Hair in London, Amsterdam, and Tel Aviv. His first feature film role came in 1971 with Romance of a Horse Thief, in which he co-starred with Ewell Brenner, Serge Gainsbourg, and Eli Wallach. From there, his screen acting career never slowed down and includes dozens of roles in features and in television, including the lead role in Arthur of the Britons in 1972, and then again playing the ruler of Camelot in King Arthur, the Young Warlord in 1975. He also led the cast in the 1976 series, Luke's Army, where he was directed by Peter Weir. Tobias also appeared as the devil in the music video for Ultravox's 1982 hit single, Him. He also acted alongside Granada series Mycroft, Mr. Charles Gray, in the 1991 micro-budget sci-fi film, Firestar First Contact, which is notable for being shot largely in a public laser tag arena due to its lack of budget. More recently, he appeared in the Conjuring sequel the Book of the Dead, and in many more Swiss film and television projects. Oliver Tobias currently lives in the country, where he is working on a tell-all autobiography at the age of 73. Well, Captain Crocker, this is a very serious matter. 
Yet I feel sure that on the basis of the story which you have told us here tonight, a British court of law will understand that you acted in defence of your own life. That, however, is for a jury to decide. Meanwhile, I have so much sympathy for you that if you choose to disappear within the next 24 hours, I promise no one will hinder you. Then it'll all come out. Certainly it will come out. What sort of proposal's that? Mary will be left to face the music held as an accomplice, maybe. No, sir, it will not do. Jack, you must go. I shall not. Calm yourself, Captain. I was only testing you. What's on this fellow rings true every time. It is a great responsibility that I take upon myself, but we will do it in due form of law. Crocker, you are the prisoner. Watson, you are a British jury. And I never met any man more eminently fitted to represent one. Now, gentleman, you have heard the evidence. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? No, not guilty. Vox Populi, Vox Dei, you are acquitted, Captain Crocker. No. No, sir, it will not do. Captain? What if the police arrest some other poor devil? What then? Then I will use all my powers to persuade them of their mistake. If they light on you, then that is another matter. However, I think that is unlikely. Come back to this lady in a year's time. And may her future and yours justify us in the judgment that we have pronounced this day. Oh, thank you. Go. <gasps> Overcome with joy, Mary throws her arms around the great detective, showering him with gratitude. Jeremy Brett, always striving to perfect his portrayal of the iconic character, found himself struggling with this emotionally charged sequence. To Stephen Doyle of the Sherlock Holmes Review, he recalled, There is a moment when the girl throws herself into Holmes' arms, and I said to Peter Hammond, I don't know how to react to this. I know what I would do, but I don't know what Holmes would do. He said, well, just do it. It was an extraordinary moment when one suddenly sees this man completely enveloped by this absolutely beautiful girl and how he's going to react to it. It was all virgin ground to me. After bidding the happy couple farewell, an uncertain Dr. Watson sits, smoking with his friend. It's almost as though you disapproved of the happiness we have fostered this day. Oh, no, I approve of that. Of course I do. I'm uneasy that you took upon yourself the duties of advocate and judge. You are too bound by forms, Watson. Forms are society, Holmes. Manners maketh man, Holmes. <laughs> it's just as well you are unique. Original air date on the ITV network was the 6th of August, 1986, at 9 p.m. Dramatized by Trevor Bowen and directed by Peter Hammond. We have met Trevor Bowen before on the Priory School, and we'll see him again several more times on The Hound of the Baskervilles, The Eligible Bachelor, The Dying Detective, and more. But the Abbey Grange marks the series' debut for a very unique director. So let's take just a moment to meet the enigmatic Peter Hammond. Born Peter Hammond Hill in Sheffield on November 15, 1923, Hammond began his show business career as a scenic artist at the Sheffield Repertory Theatre, inspired by his father, who was a picture restorer and a watercolor painter. However, in order to earn a better living, Hammond turned to acting, and his West End debut came in 1943 when he appeared in Junior Miss, an American comedy which played at the Seville. 
with looks described as reminiscent of a young Jimmy Stewart, Hammond made his screen debut in Waterloo Road in 1945 and went on to play Boy Next Door types in many films of the 40s and 50s, most notably in the popular comedy series Huggets. Hammond also starred in such early television series as The Buccaneers and The Adventures of William Tell. But in 1959, he decided that it was time for a change, and he enrolled with the BBC as a trainee director-producer. The 1960s would bring his first credits as the director of many programs, including The Avengers, Armchair Theatre, a 12-part adaptation of The Count of Monte Cristo, and the 1966 BBC serial The Three Musketeers which starred a youthful Jeremy Brett in the role of D'Artagnan. Hammond quickly established himself as a fast worker who still managed to bring flair to his projects. And he developed a trademark style in which the confines of the small studio spaces would be enlivened by the use of distortions and reflections shot through glass or caught in the reflection of mirrors. And in 1965, he won a director's BAFTA for his work on both The Avengers and a fully improvised television play called Ambrose, which starred Donald Pleasance and Elizabeth Begley. Hammond was tempted by, but resisted, the call of Hollywood, which to him seemed more about making profits than making films and he only ventured into feature films once, directing the 1970 British picture Spring and Port Wine, starring James Mason. But in the 80s and 90s, he continued working diligently in television on shows like BBC Two Playhouse, Tales of the Unexpected, and Shades of Darkness, the Granada series produced by June Wyndham Davies. So, when Davies took over as producer on the Granada Sherlock Holmes series, and she wanted talented, industrious, highly creative individuals in the director's chair, her first call was to Peter Hammond, who would return again for The Sign of Four, Wisteria Lodge, The Three Gables, and more. Forced to retire due to ill health in the mid-90s, Peter Hammond devoted himself to painting and caring for his wife. Hammond often humbly referred to himself as just another television hack, but his friend and frequent collaborator, composer Paul Lewis, said this of the man. His work was always visually brilliant. He was a visual poet. He was a private man, strangely contrary to the image of gregarious bonhomie that he gave whilst working. And that's because he came alive when he worked. Peter Hammond died October 12th, 2011, at the age of 87. And with that, let's head over to the armchairs where Luke awaits us for a discussion of this classic story. Sherlock Holmes gets impatient with fame. Crime degenerates, that is his claim. So he deals, quite unwilling, with Sir Eustace's killing and the down-under source of his dame. A curious limerick from Isaac Asimov, alluding to some minutia from the story more than anything else, but it does bring up an interesting connection to the show, which is, in the story, Lady Brackenstall was brought up in South Australia, and in the show, I think it's hinted that her father sent her there on a trip, I'm not sure, but they actually cast an Australian actress 
to play her. Yeah. And, you know, whether her Australian accent bleeds through it all, I can't really with authority say, but Anne Louise Lambert certainly was Australian by nationality, so kind of a cool choice there, I thought. Yeah. I didn't get much Australian from her, but that's all right. Yeah, well, she definitely did a good British accent, uh, but uh, (laughs) she is Australian. Well, I want to dive in, but just so folks know, a little teaser, we have something quite special to share when we get to the listener telegrams portion of the show. Mm. I'm not going to reveal it yet. We're saving it until then, but we have a little surprise for later, so stay tuned. Okay, well, let's dive in. Um, First, pretty obvious note, once again... The intro music, yeah, slight variation on the recording here. I mean, very different tail end flourish to it. Yeah, it kind of goes right into the first cue. Yeah. I mean, every time I hear one of these little variants, I mean, I listen to them, you know, in the headphones, so it's, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes, but I do still believe that they did re-record the intro. Yeah. You know, perhaps not every time, but often at least, because... There's very subtle differences in the performances of the violins here and there, you know? I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. (laughs) No, I I feel the same way too, but I haven't actually put them all side by side. But it is weird, because why would you do that? Maybe they were throwing Patrick Hours a bone and giving him a little extra work on each episode or something. (laughs) I mean, other than, you know, recycling his music over and over again and maybe not getting paid for it, I don't know. But those differences do present themselves in the headphones, which I'm assuming most of our listeners are listening in the headphones which is why we always specifically include them, you know, the specific theme music for each episode at the start of each podcast, so you can yeah. decide for yourself. We do start right in on this episode. Like, we're immediately dropped into what feels like a heist film or something. Yeah. It's like yeah. this long carriage scene, establishing shots of the house and the grounds, you know, rushing through the hallways, and then this quick succession of shots of the murder scene. Yeah, and quite quickly, we are treated to the very first peter hammond mirror shot of the series yeah <laughs> we can call it reflection number one because i'm going to be listing them as we go through and uh <laughs> for, for those who didn't catch it it's the moment when hopkins and the police pass by a bureau filled with pink glass baubles or something i don't know on their mm-hmm. on their way to see sir eustace it's really nice especially in hd all that reflecting illuminated glass is very colorful I, I like the shot a lot Are you going to also list anytime we shoot through glass? You know, we'll see. I I have some notes about that, but I I tried to just focus on the reflections this time. Yeah. Well, I I didn't make multiple notes. I just wrote in mirror shots. You know you're in a Peter Hammond episode. Right, exactly. We'll talk about this later, but you know, I don't feel like this is an egregious example of Peter Hammond's use of reflections. I feel like it works really well, um, but when you start paying attention you start to realize they're they are there more than you might notice yeah. at first but that's not the only thing that you start to realize is present in this episode which we'll come to but um the wide shot of Holmes getting Watson out of bed actually a pretty close recreation to the Paget illustration I thought which was kind of great to see yeah you know this was the first one they shot of the return so maybe they hadn't quite cast off the old way yet but i feel like they were kind of recreating the the pageants in this one a little bit yeah i thought that was great and it's also you know the game is afoot yeah maybe the most quotable identifiable lines from the whole series yeah right exactly so question for you did you notice when they're on the train and watson is kind of behind the letter holmes is holding up for the screen to read and watson is back there and he's getting out his notepad and pencil and it looks like he runs the pencil along his lips at one point. <laughs> Did you see that? I, I don't remember if I saw that in this one, but I, I think I've seen him do that before in different ones. Uh, or maybe maybe it's just a habit. Maybe he was going for like a Watson, uh, you know, ism. Yeah. Something where he you know he would run the pen or pencil over his lips to kind of get ready to write or something. I mean, well, I mean, running it through your lips, I guess, is one thing, but. Um... The way those pencils work is you twist the top and it propels the lead out. Mm. So, I mean, it's possible he was checking the length of the lead. I don't know. It's weird. He just runs it over his lips. It's it's a strange choice. Mm. But I like this train sequence a lot, especially the backgrounds. They, somehow they managed to light this in such a way that, you know, it's, that it's not blown out. We're seeing all these really nice green rolling hills passing by. And I don't know, it's a really, really nice sequence. I really like it. Yeah, you know, it also cuts to, like, maybe one of the strangest shots slash dissolves in the series, that first-class image. Right, well, I like to call that reflection number two, 
it's just weird because like it, it's it's a reflection, but it's also like a dissolve, like a film dissolve from two shots. Yeah. And I just I, actually what I was wondering is was this a reference to another movie that I didn't pick up on? Yeah, the, I, I I have a like a confusion about this sequence too. And he says, I think him murdered Watson, and then first class is flipped backwards, and if you look really closely, you can see two iterations of Holmes' face in that reflection. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, like, so I, I have a feeling Peter Hammond was like, we're going through a tunnel. Let's just grab this. You know, it's going to be great. We're going to throw it in there somewhere. It's going to look great. It's a reflection. That's, that, that could be. Yeah, because, because it gets dark in that sequence. Yeah. So I feel like th- that, that cross-fade dissolve thing you're describing is, is kind of their way of going, we went through a tunnel right here, it went dark, we cut to this shot, and now we're coming out of the tunnel. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird. I think that's a good explanation. I think that's as good as anything. Like I said, unless it was a reference to a movie. It adds emphasis to that line, he says, but it's just such a strange thing. It's also doubly strange because it's not actually a great shot. It's fuzzy. It's kind of soft. It's too dark, probably. You know what I mean? Yeah. I guess the why is just because it's Peter Hammond, you know? Sure. Well, I mean, it adds something because you go, what happened there? <laughs> yeah, but like, I'm, I'm with you. Like, I don't, I feel like there's something we're missing. Like, maybe, maybe there's a missing homage to something, but, uh, yeah. So then we arrive at the house and we have this sequence where the horse, the carriage is approaching the house. I find these choices very interesting because we see we see Holmes notice the log, which is great. And then we get a few more shots of the carriage approaching kind of from the driver POV uh, as it goes mm-hmm. up. And really, it, it's quite a few seconds. I mean, these shots, it's like seven shots of uh, approaching the house. I mean, it's all beautiful. It all looks great. But we're certainly taking our time, you know, in getting there, which, which um, it just seems like a strange use of the time. Speaking of the house, uh, we are back at the location from the Speckled Band for this house. Right, yeah. Which is kind of cool to see, and it's also not under construction anymore. Yeah, the, the house is a couple different houses, um, you know, different parts of different houses. But uh, I also thought it was interesting that when later when we come back to the house and there's a wide shot of the exterior, we hear the, the way-ah call of the peacock again, Yeah, which is, again, consistent with the sounds of the Speckled Band. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they use that sound a lot. I, I've never heard so many peacock calls as in this series. Yeah. But moving on from here, Inspector Hopkins makes an appearance. He was played by Paul Williamson, and you know he does a fine job. Hopkins, the character, does return later in the Golden Ponce Ney, but he is played by a different actor, Nigel Planer, which... You know, I mean, it's it's a little unfortunate that we couldn't keep the continuity, but again, I think we all know by that point late in the series, attention to continuity had begun to slip somewhat, um, or or perhaps the actor just wasn't available. Or, you know, who can say? But yeah, this Inspector Hopkins uh, is good, mm-hmm. and it's his first appearance, and um, here he is. Yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah. Well, and then very quickly we are introduced to reflection number three at the five minute and fifty second mark. Uh, <laughs> Holmes, Watson, and Inspector Hopkins stood in front of a mirror with Watson mainly seen in the glass. Also very colorful, red candles, red stained glass, which is followed immediately by reflection number four. (laughs) The very next shot as they approach, it's that same bright pink bureau of baubles or whatever. Really colorful, very nice. But red seems to be the predominant color here. This next scene with Lady Brackenstall's sitting room, I mean, we got red furniture, red plant coverings, Red flowers, red window dressings, red fireplace mantle runner, red picture frame, red book on the table next to Lady Brackenstall. Of course, her bruises are all red. I mean, later on, we get the red bell ropes and the gag used on Mary is red. I mean, some of it is obviously the house. I mean, the wallpaper yeah. in the halls is, is is pure red. But one really kind of is forced to wonder how much of this is Peter Hammond. I know. I also wonder if it was supposed to, like, subconsciously be uh, that the maid was manipulating the scene as well, like putting all the red around her like she's, you know, surrounded by danger and blood, and that might be a stretch. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting because it appears in almost every shot of this entire episode. Yeah. Normally when there's the use of a color like this, a recurring color, a recurring theme, it does represent, like you said, danger, death, blood, something... But it's like, what does it represent in this episode? I mean, what can it represent when it's in every single shot? I think it's just Peter Hammond being Peter Hammond. Yeah, running with the theme. It's possible. Yeah. I don't think it'd be controversial to say this is the most romantic episode of the whole series. Oh, yeah. But it's also kind of 
the most melancholy and tragic in a way, you know? So I, I wonder if it was maybe red represents that. Yeah. During uh, Lady Brackenstall's explanation of Sir Eustace's drinking, there's a shot of Holmes just kind of clocking Watson being sucked into the story right. emotionally. Yeah. And then we go back to Holmes and he's, he looks like he's already dismissing her story in his mind. He's a bit incredulous and it, it's like a good decision as an actor, I think. But then in the story, he believes it. Yeah. They, they kind of leave and like, well, this is already solved. But I don't know if that was meant to just sprinkle a little like, eh, there's, there's some doubt here. You know what I took away from it was just that Holmes is analyzing every word that's coming out of her mouth, and it's so intense. It's it's his performance is amazing, but I just feel like what's happening is like there's some subconscious thing in his brain going something here doesn't add up. Yeah, you know, like I haven't, I can't put my finger on it. It's almost like he knows this is being done for effect, and it's working on Watson. But he can't, but you know, there's no reason for her to lie. So he, he's kind of, you know, he's, it's not that he doesn't believe her. It's just that something is amiss and he can't quite work it out yet. Yeah. That's, that's the feeling I got from that sequence. But yeah, it's quite something to look at. Well, in this sequence we're in now in, in the sitting room, we get reflection number five and reflection number six, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, Holmes's face in the foreground, Lady Brackenstall's face in a mirror in the background. And then a few minutes yeah. later, Teresa Wright is is by that same mirror, so uh, more mirrors being used uh, already. Mm -hmm. um, again, they don't feel terrible. They don't feel Mazarin stone. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not terrible, but over the top, maybe Mazarin stone. <laughs> right, right, exactly. The next sequence, when we get into uh, you know the big room, the dining room, it also introduces us to something that is recurrent in this episode, which is the difference between close-up sound and room sound yeah you know it, it seems like there's quite a few instances in this one where they just decided hey we're just going to mic this room and everybody's going to sound really far away mm -hmm. and echoey and you know like we're in a big room well that might not have been a decision it might have been like we don't need radio mics on this we got the boom and then right it turns into a really super wide shot and then the sound guy's screwed basically right because you can't have the sh mic in the shot yeah it's hard to know if it is a choice or not i guess we'll never know really but yeah until you really pay attention to it it's it's not bothersome you know it's fine no uh, i never really noticed it until this this viewing but as you watch this episode there's a lot of it there's a lot of that in this episode a lot of places where people just get quiet because there's no mic near them you know it's just far yeah, away for sure so it, it's different it's interesting but we do get reflection number seven here, which is uh, at the 17 minute and 45 second mark, Holmes and Watson and Hopkins standing at the refreshment station, which mm -hmm. again looks maybe like there was some extra red <laughs> added under the glasses. I mean, I know the wine is red, <laughs> yeah. but there's like a little uh, something under the glasses, which is red. And of course, the cork itself on the bottle has red on it. <laughs> I, yeah, it's just, it never ends. Yeah. But, uh, and then technically we get, we'll call it reflection number 7A because there's just another shot where Holmes is holding up the glasses but he's looking into the mirror this time so quite a few I wonder what it was like explaining all these shots on the day yeah <laughs> like so we're gonna get this shot like yeah we're gonna get that shot but I'm gonna shoot through this mirror because it'll be cool I, I gotta believe that June Wyndham Davies just said look Peter's in charge do whatever he says mm -hmm. that's how it went down well, the next sequence is the train station, which, again, we get a reflection. Uh, we see Holmes and Watson waiting for the train, but just their reflections as the glass is passing by of the arriving train. Again, doesn't put you out of the episode. It's, it's, it's tastefully done. And even more red in this sequence, I mean, it's just everywhere you look. Mm -hmm. That stop-go signal that switches from green to red glass for the train. Mm -hmm. I mean, really nice, really nice choice. Yeah. But another example of red and then we get reflection number nine when Holmes is on the train. There's literally a mirror in the train that he manages to shoot and tilt down mm -hmm. from. Uh, <laughs> so we get a, a shot of him in a nice red train seat. And then we get reflection number 10 at the 20-minute mark just before the commercial break when Holmes taps his stick on the glass, waking up Watson. And then behind him, we even see more red in the form of an advertisement for Camp Coffee. There's like a you know one of those ads mm -hmm. they have at the train station. So I don't know. I just feel like you know once you start paying attention to the red and the reflections, yeah. this episode kind of becomes hard to watch. <laughs> you got to go into it not wanting to look at those things 
Yeah. Which I was afraid that maybe I wouldn't be able to enjoy this episode once I started to see these things that I couldn't unsee. But in fact, you can. Yeah, you definitely can. Yeah. It's almost like too fortuitous how some of these things come together in the episode. I mean, at this train station, which presumably was something like a real building and not a set that they built, yeah. the archways are red. You know, the parked train yeah. is red. And then obviously you get the train man who, uh, you know, Holmes has his eye on him. He's the guy who kind of gives him the clue that the next train is coming. Did you notice his necktie color? Red. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's like Peter Hammond when there's just red everywhere. Let's just go with this and put even more red in there. I mean, it, it's so like it, when Holmes climbs down the ladder to get the gravestone of the pet dog, the ladder is red. I mean, obviously I think some of that is you know, happenstance. Sure. I, I do like that sequence when uh, Holmes is down there getting the stone and his hands, he's, he's using his hands and getting all dirty and rolling up his sleeves and they're getting all muddy. Yeah, I wondered if uh, Esther Dean, the costume lady, yeah. would appreciate that scene or if she was sitting back going like, God damn it, he's <laughs> dirty again, you know? Yeah. Because then he puts his hands behind his back and you can see that like underneath his jacket's dirty, like he's just getting it everywhere. Yeah. The moment when they're walking up, there's this line that's like basically just off screen. He says, how many frustrating episodes for the laboring men here could one reconstruct from this mechanical cemetery? Yeah. It's an interesting line. It makes you think maybe the writer was a repairman or a tinker or something in his spare time, being sympathetic to the scene of those broken machines. Yeah, I really like that line, and I never noticed it, you know, until watching it with the subtitles on. Like you said, it's kind of out of earshot in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, after that sequence, they end up back in the room with the fireplace I would save this for the Jeremy bits, but it's just too good to not talk about. Obviously, him scaling that fireplace, I mean, could anything yeah. be more perfect? It's Jeremy Brett doing his own stunt, for one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's nothing too ridiculous, but it certainly adds to the tenseness of it. I mean, he, he could have fallen. He could have slipped. Well, I like that he just kind of launches right into it, too. He just turns around and just jumps. Yeah. Just mid-sentence kind of thing. And I mean, again, you know, this is the first one of the return, and he's obviously, you know, younger and in great shape and he's still doing those things and it's just so great it's just so great to see it yeah there is a um gaff here yeah and it, what it looks like is there's possibly a telephone wire up on top of the mantelpiece that's run you know running behind jeremy actually when, when you're looking at him up there yeah but i wondered if that was actually just the copper that connects to the bell rope hmm. kind of running through a more like modernized clear tube I mean, it's secured with like very modern yeah. plastic uh, nail-in clips. So I wondered if maybe, you know, the cameraman was setting up a shot and he was up high like that. Yeah. And maybe the shot should have just been a little bit lower, but maybe it just felt right. You know what I mean? You yeah. just, unless you're going to cover it with a rug or something, I don't know what you would have done. I mean, I think they could have covered it. I, I think, honestly, that's an instance where, you know, the, Peter Hammond probably didn't want to get all the way up there. <laughs> Yeah, and the camera guy probably wasn't as you know d didn't have the same eye for those kind of things, and it was it was a very high shot, and it probably just didn't have enough eyes on it. We also don't know how it was how it was shot because if it was on a crane, you know, I don't know what monitoring was like back then, so it yeah. could have been that you just couldn't see it on the screen. It could yeah. have been as simple as they focused it on the ground and then put the camera up in the air and then yeah, hope for the best. I, d I don't know exactly how it was back then. You know, it's a minor thing. I mean, I, I've always noticed it, but I didn't actually know what it was, so I didn't really care. Yeah. But when, when Michael Cox pointed out in his book that it was modern electrical wiring, then it's like, well, okay, you know, that's unfortunate. Yeah, but I, I really think if the white clips weren't there, yeah, I don't know, I feel like it would have played better. Just, just because you can see the copper coming off the rope pole, it's not unbelievable to think that, that those two things could be connected, but the white clips kind of do it. But I think given the choice, I, I feel like if they would have even known of it, they probably would have just put a piece of molding over it. Yeah, or just brought the camera down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. it's just a little flub, but it's it's not a huge thing. In that same scene, when they're sitting at the table, you can clearly see Watson's watch chain mm. with the coin with the square hole in it. And it reminded me of that annotation from the Redheaded League about the coin whether it's a square hold coin or a coin with a square hole. Right. It's one of those things, but it's it's on his chain there. So yes. they, they answered it that way. Exactly. The next sequence, which uh, is outside with the fountain, I thought the framing of this scene was really great. You get the first shot, which is wide, through the archway, so it's kind of framed up really nice. And then the very next shot, also great, but it's, 
low and you've got Holmes and Mary together at the bottom of the frame, Teresa and Watson at the top. I, it's definitely a, a masterfully framed shot. Mm-hmm. I'm tempted to call the reflection at the 27 minute mark uh, another reflection because you can kind of see Holmes in the reflection of the fountain, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. it's not an amazing reflection shot. So we won't count it in the tally, but I'm sure it was going through Peter Hammond's mind. I mean, come on, this is Peter Hammond. Yeah. N- no reflection shall go to waste, but maybe you'll have to verify this one for me. It was something I forgot to go back and check, but I wondered if this was a recurring thing as well. Um, where Sherlock is pointing at the polished brass sign outside the office for the Southern Cross line. Yeah. I seem to remember he did this in the, the Redheaded League as well when they went to the bank and that we see him pointing it like he's directing Watson, like, here we are. This yeah. is the location. You know, and 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 it's like he's almost reading it in the in the reflection, but but there's no dialogue there, you know. It is interesting that he points it out, but it's also, yeah, you're right, there is that reflection in that shot. Also, did you notice little red stars? On that sign. Mm. Well, I guess I didn't notice that. Peter Hammond is directing. You got to imagine he goes, okay, we need a sign for this thing. First of all, we need to be able to shoot a reflection in it. And also we need some red. We got to make sure <laughs> both those things are, are taken care of in this sign, people. It's possible. There is a quick shot of Holmes pointing at something with his walking stick in the shot immediately after it. Mm. Like it, it's, it's a little bit more of a wide shot. They're going through the columns and he's kind of pointing at something as they're entering the building for the Southern Cross. I don't know. It's really brief, but it's it's also really weird. Yeah. It's like he's pointing at someone on the crew or something, and then they cut in. It's really weird. I feel like Jeremy Brett just does that from time to time. He just uh, finds something to point out with his stick. Mm-hmm. Though I have to say, we did pass, in going that far ahead, we did pass a few reflections. We had <laughs> reflection number 12 uh, as Holmes taps the driver with his stick, and they're leaving Abbey Grange. They pass in front of a mirror that's at the entrance. Mm. And we also have reflection number 13, which is when Lady Brackenstall is watching them depart and we see the reflection of the carriage passing her face in the glass. Yeah. So uh, we get both of those reflections. Those kind of things are not incidental. Right. You know, you've got to get the camera right and you've got to get the position right. So it's those were set up. And once we arrive at the Southern Cross Line offices, whew, there's no shortage of red in this sequence. We have a yeah. red shipping manifest book, red chess pieces, mm-hmm. red stained glass. The attendant, Mr. Viviani, is wearing a red vest. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I should just stop because, I mean, (laughs) anyway. Yeah. Uh, And we also, of course, get the wonderful reflection number 14 at the 32-minute mark of Holmes, Watson, and Viviani in the reflection of that uh, ship model case. That's a really long segment. Yeah. Just in reflection. And it's not not the best reflection either. It's not totally clear. So it's a very odd choice, I thought, just, just for how long it is. I will say in that particular reflection... I thought that Jeremy Brett looked so much like the Paget illustration, yeah. Sherlock Holmes, that it, that it's kind of neat. I, I did and did enjoy that. For some reason, he just he just looks maybe it's this distortion in the glass or something, but he looks like the Paget Holmes in in that shot to me. I, I like when Holmes asks where the Rocket Gibraltar ship is currently at, and the clerk goes to point to it at a map, and Holmes just starts playing with the globe, not even looking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just yeah. another definitely Jeremy thing. He can hear him. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I do like the moment where Mr. Viviani says, you know, only through the study of the good doctor's masterly exposition of your work that I now have any small capacity to reason. And Watson looks quite pleased. And yeah. Holmes notices and he says, Watson, are you taking notes? Yeah. <laughs> Just to knock him back down a peg. There's nice little moments and the smile from Mrs. Burbage on her way out the door. It's like... Well, and this whole sequence is a, a concoction of Trevor Bowen because it's not in the story yeah. this way at all. These characters don't exist in the story. So right. it's definitely very, very nicely done. But once they get back to Baker Street, when Crocker arrives, not that this is even a note about being red, it just so happens to be red, but when Crocker comes in, the camera is fairly high, so we're kind of looking down, and you get a very good view, which you rarely get, of the floor and the rug Mm -hmm. in Baker Street, which is red does have a lot of red in it, but you just get a nice look at it, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Add some texture to Baker Street. Bite on that, Captain Croker. That's a great line. There's some really interesting stuff in this Baker Street sequence. If you look out the windows, Mm -hmm. it seems to be a a real pea super out there. I mean, (laughs) it's it's. But if you look really closely on some of the later shots, it it looks like they just basically have set some diffuser fabric up 
Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. frankly like it's right next to the bricks that are outside so you can you can kind of see it. It just kind of creates a a wall of light brown which I'm assuming they were kind of guessing would play well as fog and it does. Yeah. But if you if you really look closely at it you can tell it's not fog. It's just yeah. a, a scrim. Maybe the sun came out and it was just too direct and they're like we got to soften that, you know, yeah. make it look something like what it was supposed to be. So this is a dumb note, but when Captain Croker takes his first drag on the cigar, there's an unintended sound effect that accompanies the movement of his cigar. Really? It's like a it's like a squeaky door noise. It's like Oh, right. But it's like right <laughs> as he pulls the cigar out of his mouth. It's just kind of a little comedy moment. Yes. And a very nerdy tool reference here. The multiplex knife that he pulls out of his pocket, which I always expect to be red because of the Swiss Army knife, is black in this situation which may be telling also. Yeah. But it has a Phillips head screwdriver on it, which I had to Google, but it wasn't invented until the 1930s. Are you sure? Pretty sure. Because there is a whole segment in the um, Bering Gould, I think, or maybe it's the Klinger book, about Swiss Army knives and how they uh, they did include a screwdriver so they could disassemble their guns, but maybe it was a flathead screwdriver. They had flatheads, yep, or slotted, they call them. Okay, yeah. Because I had to do a bunch of research for about screws at one point. <laughs> oh, interesting. Well, that's interesting to know. Yeah, I, I didn't actually I didn't actually notice you could see that it was a Phillips head. He turns it really quickly, but it's like when you know what you're looking for, you're like that's because the flathead is usually like pretty flat and and, yeah. and wide, and it's in the other side. When it's like back with this corkscrew, it's usually the the Phillips head. Interesting. Well, this sequence here, when they start flashing back to Crocker's story, I have to admit. There's a shot in this that I've always really loved, and it's the one that is the night after the party, and all the chairs are empty, and the streamers are scattered everywhere, and mm-hmm. Crocker is just so lonely, and he walks through, and he's saying his line about how he'll never be a free man again. I don't know why, but that shot is always struck with me. Yeah, I think it's because it's just like a static shot. The camera doesn't move, but you know, there's so much color in it, and so many things set up in it, and he walks through, and he kicks the ground, and you know... Does his little yeah. I, I just enjoy it every time. Every time it's on, I enjoy that moment. It's just so nice. Yeah, the music is nice. His dialogue is nice. Everything's good. It's a nice m- moment for the actor. I did make a note on this moment, but I put that the quote boat party location. It did seem a little bit like they just stuck life preservers on a wall, right? <laughs> to sell the idea of a ship. Yeah, but like it was a boat themed restaurant almost. Yeah. you know, because it was definitely not a boat. It wasn't moving. Yeah. But like I thought, like if you took away the life preservers, would you know you were on a boat? It's true. It's true. But I think I think it works. I mean, they could have yeah. they could have rocked the camera and added in some wave sounds or something. But uh, yeah, no, it's fine. No, no, it's no, no. fine. When Crocker is when he sits down to talk about his meeting with Mary and how he's meeting her again and again. Mm-hmm. If you watch Jeremy and he's on the right side of frame, he hardly blinks. He hardly moves. It's like he knows that this is not his scene yeah. and he's letting this other actor have his moment and it's just it's just nice. It's just it's really nice to watch Jeremy give him his moment, you know. And yeah. again, it's just one of those little things on re- on repeated views this show rewards. I mean, I think you have to say that Oliver Tobias's performance of Croker was was pretty great, you know, yeah. noble yet forlorn. Yeah. And I wonder if Jeremy was like this guy's killing it. I'm just going to sit back. Yeah. Literally and watch. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, there's that moment where he gets in his face and says, if you lie to me, I'll crush you. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's just that he's such a imposing. Yeah. He's such an imposing character. He's like, his voice is so deep. And he's so big. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that inter- interchange there when Holmes looks a little worried for a second. It's really great. I yeah. mean, it's really great. I also, it also felt like another weird, sort of call back to the speckled band and other ones, you know, where Holmes doesn't back down from physical threats. Yeah, definitely. I do think we need to point out the amazing piece of music during Crocker's dialogue here. It's really romantic, yet yeah. melancholy and tragic. It's like it's just it perfectly fits this episode. Yeah, it's it's the Abbey Grange theme. It is. And and that theme takes us into his flashbacks, uh, which I never really noticed until my very last viewing, but this entire flashback between Mary and Crocker when they say goodbye. 
Yeah. It's again, all one take, no cuts. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, the the acting, even the camera, when they, when they move, it's, it's not just one stationary shot. They move across the room (laughs) to the fireplace and it's still, it's, it's just one camera move. It's one take. But, but even all that aside, I just think the drama Mm -hmm. is just so stellar. I mean, the writing, the acting, everything, it just, it literally chokes me up no matter how many times I see it. It's, it's, I think it's exactly what you said. It's it's the most romantic moment yeah. in the entire Granada series, I would say. But it also feels like a romance movie. Yeah. Like it feels like a different kind of show, especially in that moment when she's like, she keeps turning around but going towards the other side of the room. And yeah. you just get these different views of her. And, you know, the friend will do, Mary. There's a measure of my love for you that's so strong it'll live on crumbs. Friend will do. It's like, yeah. it's, it's just the whole thing is pretty heartbreaking. But, you know, it, 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 it's like, that line could have been read badly and been over the top cheesy. Yeah. But the performances, they're just, they fit in this show perfectly. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not a romantic period drama. It's not a mellow drama of that kind. And yet it, it again, it could have gone the wrong way. It could have gone over the top. And these two performers just nail it so brilliantly. Yeah. It's so subtle. That's the, I think that's why I personally like it because I wouldn't like it if it were too over the top but because it's so subtle it really hits home for me yeah it's very measured and and i think you know stephen fry reads croker with an australian accent but it's quite different to the show Hmm. and when you hear them back to back uh, as i did when i was researching the episode i think again it's another testament to the showrunners and to the actors of the series to to pull what they did from the original stories and to change it to to fit yeah because i think it also kind of illustrates how one person's interpretation of the same text can be different to someone else's. Mm, yeah. And I wonder if this is possibly an explanation to why some people don't like the episodes that are too similar to the original text, because maybe the image in their head is so burned in that when you see the same dialogue coming out differently, it, yeah. you know, it feels weird. But whereas an episode of the show that's a bit looser with the story feels like more of an homage rather than a straight like cover song kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, possibly. But Crocker in this scene and all the all of his scenes they're so different to Stephen Fry's performance that you could have a totally different show if it was a different actor. That's interesting. I I actually didn't I haven't listened to the Stephen Fry rendition of this one. I'll have to check that out now. <laughs> you should. Yeah. He does all the Australian accents. Yeah. It's fun. But speaking of performances, I have to say the actor who played Sir Eustace, Conrad Phillips, for a brief little performance, I think it's entirely fantastic. I, I, I thought, I mean, I didn't do a bio on Mr. Phillips just because, you know, his part is so small. And yeah, but he, I mean, he's a pretty prolific actor. He has like 111 IMDb credits to his name, and most of those are TV appearances for which he had multiple appearances. So it's, you know, it's quite a few more than that. Yeah. And I mean, he was in like The Avengers, The Prisoner, Faulty Towers. But it's like, you know, he's one of those actors that tends to fade into the background. Like I, I've seen all those shows and I don't even remember him in them. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got to go back yeah. and look for him again. But I, I just feel like he was great in this. I mean, he was really great. I really liked him. I, I, I just thought, again, he could have gone too far, but he didn't. He just kept it exactly right. So I thought it was great. I love that shot of him stumbling in and appearing in front of his own painting. I do like that, but I, I almost have a bad note because... Yeah. You can't really say that it looks exactly like him. I mean, I mean, obviously no. it's him when he's younger or or something. But it's like, I mean, the fact that the that that painting is huge. I mean, that that must yeah. be ten feet tall, you know, minimum. That thing is huge. So it's a great prop and it's a great thing that they did. But is it the same actor? It's hard to know. <laughs> I don't know. I think the thing that sells it though is the hair coloring, like the little smattering of gray. Yeah, he's got gray on both sides in the in the painting the same way. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like okay, that's him. Yeah, that part that part was good. I did think that this was maybe some of the best fight choreography in the series. Yeah. And I know that might be controversial to say. It's not 100 percent perfect or anything. Uh, there's a lot of swinging, you know, but the swinging of Sir Eustace's blackthorn cudgel, I thought were pretty believable. Yeah. And the way that Croker's like blocking them, it's 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 the camera work though. It's like we're tight in yeah. and we're handheld and it feels like you're in a fight. And then when it cuts out to them kind of like flopping on the table yeah, and it's just a wide static shot, like there's, there's no, there's no action. It doesn't feel like as much action, but your comments 
almost verbatim reflect mine. I mean, yeah. I had this down as a good note, but I put sorta <laughs> next to yeah, it because exactly. it's like it starts off really good. Like those blows that uh, Eustace is is getting on Crocker, it, it looks like he's getting hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, that that looks brutal. That that's a good stuff, but then. It just loses momentum, you know, when they start climbing on the table and slipping and he's swinging in the air. Yeah, it, it kind of loses it, but it ends well. Yeah. Overall, quite quite good. I mean, it, it could have been bad. It wasn't bad. It was typical of the show, I thought, but then the beginning of it was better. Right, exactly. And then the end of it's nice because we're in a close-up and it's kind of dramatic because we're like watching them, you know, size each other up and then he just smacks them and it's like yeah. <laughs> crazy sound effect. And I like that he basically kills a guy, you know, in his brains all over the floor and he just sets the murder weapon on his chest and walks away yeah and there's more red in this scene the close-up of sir eustace's eyeball yeah definitely (laughs) i thought this was a much better use of a practical effect than the wax brains on the floor yeah i wonder what they put in his eye because it's just it's just like open your eye we're just going to squirt some stuff in there and we'll get a quick shot I thought it was pretty effective. It was effective. He's clearly, I mean, he, obviously he's freshly dead, so any twitching is still uh, forgivable. Yeah. But he definitely was having a hard time kind of keeping his eye with that stuff in there. Well, I think that's believable. You understand? Yeah. Well. And we'll come back to the blood on the rug when we get to the bad. Okay. There is a line here that Teresa has when Crocker pours the wine. And, you know, in the story, the excuse for why we had to pour wine into three glasses is because Teresa didn't want any. Mm-hmm. She, she didn't drink the wine. Right. But what's funny is there is a line there to clarify that, but you, I mean, you really, I, I never picked up on it until I turned the subtitles on in my very last viewing where she says, thank you, no, Captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's kind of like a throwaway. Yeah, it doesn't really look like he's even offering her the drink. <laughs> no, I know. I think it was maybe some bad direction on that one. Yeah, but but it, but it is there. Yeah. I did think this was one for friend of the podcast, uh, Peter Sokolowski from Miriam Webster. Mm. Because he says, uh, in the story, he says, if the lady's maid had been less abstemious and accepted your glass of port, your ingenuity might have fooled me. Yes, yes. Abstemious meaning not self-indulgent, especially when eating and drinking. Yeah, that's definitely one for the uh, dictionary guy. (laughs) (laughs) But I I just thought it was, you know, again, because those glasses are technically a, a major part of the mystery. Yeah. It's kind of odd that it would be such a throwaway thing. I mean, again, like you said, he does say that line at the end. But again, unless you got your dictionary out, are you even going to catch right. what is, what is, what is, what is, what's being said there if you, if you haven't read the story before? I, I don't know. Again, it's one of those things where if you've read the story and you know what's supposed to be happening, all the pieces are there. But um, you know, similar to um, the Priory School, it's like the pieces are all there. But unless you're really listening, really paying attention, have the subtitles on, and are willing to put the pieces together for yourself, uh, it's not totally clear all the time, which is yeah. maybe my only real knock against this episode uh, is, is that. But as we are now back on Baker Street, we can mention the final reflections, number 15 through 17, which are just a few quick shots of Watson in the mirror as he goes to open the door for Lady Brackenstall, and uh, when they exit, they go back through the mirror again. We've got something like 17 reflections in this episode. And Lady Brackenstall is wearing one of the most memorable images of the whole series, maybe. Her her all-black outfit with a red tie. Neckerchief or something. Yeah. It's very punk rock. Oh, definitely, yeah. But you'll also be pleased to know that's not the actual final bit of red. It's almost like Peter Hammond went, okay, everybody, I'm going to knock him over the head with red one last time. (laughs) And you guessed it, it's in a mirror. And it's over Jeremy's shoulder when basically he gets the hug and mm-hmm. you know they're they're all yep. leaving out the door and it's like they just put a big piece of red yep. in the in the mirror and they yep. just reflect on it in the mirror yep. it's just like a big red circle oval well maybe maybe it was just Mary's color and so she's filled up the room now and even in the, even the reflections are red that's how much impact she has perhaps perhaps there is a great line here where Holmes says gentle man of the jury yeah. It's it's not in the story that way. In the story he says gentleman. Mm. So this it is a really nice touch. I don't know if it's Jeremy or the writer here, right. but there is actually a quote out there uh of Jeremy's where he says both Watson and Ted are gentlemen as well as being gentlemen. So maybe it was Jeremy. I don't know, not sure. Either way, a, a very nice touch. Yeah. There was another nice little thing I thought in this scene when 
Croker is describing that he deliberately dropped the candlestick so that the wax was splashed near the window. Yeah. And Holmes looks elated, like he's really impressed by Crocker here. Yeah. It's just it's in the background, but it's just this nice little acting moment from from Jeremy. Subtle, but nice. Yeah, absolutely. And the the discussion at the end of the episode between Holmes and Watson discussing forms and forms of society and manners maketh men. And then he says it's just as well that you're unique. And then we cut to this like extreme close up on both of them. Yeah. But because they're both drinking port, they had to bring the glasses like all the way up into their face. It's a little weird. <laughs> yeah. But uh, similarly, Edward Hardwick was doing that with his cigarette, you know, multiple times in this episode, just kind of holding it by his face because otherwise you wouldn't see it. Yeah. But, it, you know, it looks good in the close. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Latin vox populi, vox dei is uh, Latin for the voice of the people is the voice of God. So um, that's what that comes from. Let's talk about the books for a moment. Yeah. The Abbey Grange was first published in the Strand Magazine in September 1904 and in Collier's on December 31st, 1904. You mentioned the game is afoot, and you know, you're know you right, it's like famously attributed to Holmes, but actually Holmes is quoting Shakespeare right? Uh, because this line comes from the first part of Henry IV and also, again, in Henry V, though he says the game's afoot with an apostrophe and Holmes does not use the contraction, also noteworthy, in spite of being a famous line for Holmes, he does only say it once, and that's here in the Abbey Grange. Yeah. Watson, however, does say it in Wisteria Lodge, but um, Les Klinger points out in his annotated book that at least it was uttered by Holmes once, <laughs> which makes it yeah. more respectable than the meme of uh, Elementary My Dear Watson, which he never actually said. So, so that's cool. Well, it's like when people say to me, Luke, I am your father. Right. It's like, <laughs> that's not a quote from the movie, man. Yeah, good point. So the first note I made about the story was, you know, when he says, we're moving in high life, Watson, crackling paper, EB monogram, coat of arms, picturesque address. I started looking up crackling paper because I thought maybe it was a certain kind of paper, but I think really all it means was that it was nice paper because it actually, you could crackle it, mm. whereas like paper of the day was like pulpy and thick and soft. Yeah. So I assume that's what they meant, but I... I started looking up, I was trying to find anything about like vintage paper, you know, being called crackling paper. And I found this article that was about, in quotes, paper men and the habits of paper men and like people that work with paper and that they'll chew on paper and then <laughs> they like to crackle paper. And it was this really weird article, but nothing specifically about this other than it probably was due to it being crisp. Just like a stiffer. Which was expensive at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. In that train ride, Holmes mentions what he plans to do in his declining years, but uh, as it turns out, he only wrote two of the stories. Blanched Soldier and Lion's Mane were two from the canon that were not written by Watson, but written by Holmes. Right. But uh, he would have been 72 years old when he wrote those stories in 1926, which is um, when they were placed. If you have access to the Stephen Fry audiobooks, you should definitely listen to this episode. His Australian accent for Lady Brackenstall and the Maid were pretty great. <laughs> but there's also uh, a few lines that I noticed were changed, and I just don't know if it's just because of the version I had. You know, I'm reading the Baron Gould, but there were certain just little things that got changed in the version I have. It says, Heaven will not let such wickedness endure. And when Stephen Fry reads it, it was changed to God. Yeah, well... We've talked about this a little bit before, and I don't I don't remember which episode it was, but the fact that sometimes the American edition versus the original British had replaced words like God, yeah. for example. But Leslie Klinger actually made a note about this, and he speculates that such changes would have been made between the different editions to kind of coarsen the dialogue for less refined readers in the U.S. <laughs> mm. So, for example... That's that's his excuse for why they changed God to heaven, and like they changed devil to fiend, and they changed damn to curse. But see, I think the opposite actually. I, I think like removing damn and God seems like exactly what you'd expect from a puritanical American censor at the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's 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 a lot of changes. There's a lot of notes about the changes in the annotated books, but uh, it's interesting to see how it uh, evolved over time. Yeah. We could talk about Beeswing for a moment. Yeah. Which in the series, they say crusting. Right. But in in the stories, it's Beeswing. And according to the Klinger annotated book, 
Beeswing is a translucent, flaky film found in older wines, particularly those such as port, that are bottle-aged for many years, and that typically port drinkers are very careful not to, quote, break the beeswing by shaking the bottle. Mm. So, you know, again, it's just a little bit of an extra bit of data. The Bering Gould said, the word may occasion a trifle of difficulty among Americans in the s- syllabic division because they thought we might say B swing. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, seeing as how we're talking about the books, we can talk about the pageant illustrations just for a moment. There's one that I really like, which is Holmes on the train, and he appears to be wearing a Hamburg. Yep. Yeah, is it a Hamburg? I mean, it's kind of it's hard to tell in a drawing. It's hard to tell in a drawing, but it's you know, the the edges, the brim is curled up. Yeah. And the crown is pretty square, you know. So it's you know, it's hard to draw hats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'd say that that was a Hamburg. Yeah, definitely. And he's wearing the brown Hamburg in this one, so it's nice. Yeah. Well, and I know we don't like to talk about the dates too much, but uh, Martin Dakin, I, I always get a kick out of his book. He speculates that since this story was released a mere seven years after the events occurred, and the only reason Watson would do something like that, you know, revealing the details of the murder and therefore implicating Crocker or Croker, would be because Crocker and his bride must have met an untimely demise. And if they were dead now, there'd be no reason for Watson not to spill the beans. So That's a leap. Yeah, well, <laughs> Martin Dakin, you know, I think he said something like, maybe the ship that they were both on together sunk or something. Or they just went to Australia. Yeah, but it always he always makes me chuckle with his, uh, his theories. I did want to talk a little bit about the fight scene from the story because there's a line that says, uh, he welted her across the face with a stick he had in his hand, and that stick being his blackthorn cudgel. Hmm. And had he hit her with that in the show, had we seen that? Yeah. I mean, not only would it have been quite graphic, um, but the justification for Coker killing him might have been too easy, yeah. you know, and that everybody would just be on his side. Yeah. It kind of just looks like he backhands her. But, I mean, that stick was, it's like a baseball on the end of a baseball bat. Well, he does backhand her, but she also, like, spins around twice. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty hard blow. It's a hard blow, but it, it didn't look like attempted murder. It looked like a... You know, he hit her with the back of his hand. Sure. But, I mean, had he hit her with a stick, it's like... Well, if anybody ever adapts it in the future, maybe they'll take it to the next level. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about the good and the bad and the Jeremy. I mean, I feel like we've said a lot of things already, but yeah. um, if there's any unaddressed bits you'd like to throw out there... I don't know if I, if I would say it's good or bad, but it's, it's kind of typical of their relationship. You know, Holmes wakes up Watson... They get on the train, and the first thing, you know, like Watson says something benign. You know, he says, oh, that thawed us out, because, like, they supposedly drank warm tea because they were just huddled in their coats, according to the story, the whole way out. Yeah. Basically, Holmes goes right into the thing of, if you were looking at this from the point of view of a story instead of a scientific exercise, you know, um, it's, like, comes really early in the journey, whereas Holmes just kind of starts in on Watson. Watson just kind of just, well, why don't you write him yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of dismisses it, but it's like... Well, and again, like I, I, I almost would put that in the, you know, I, it's hard to call it bad, but it's, it's, you know, this is Edward Hardwick's first episode, and I kind of feel like he's a bit wooden, a bit dry on this one, yeah. which it's fine. It's not bad. I think he's dry in the story, though. I think a lot of the lines that he says are actually Holmes' line from the story. It's true. It's true. But you'd think if like your best friend told you your stories were terrible, you'd do something more than go, why don't you write them yourself? Yeah. Maybe. Or, or maybe not. Maybe they're just that good of friends. Yeah. But in terms of good notes, I have to give one to Trevor Bowen because I feel like the writing in this episode is really quite great. Yeah. I mean, especially the scenes that aren't in the story. I mean, we talked about the Southern Cross line parts. I love the part when Crocker is confronting Sir Eustace. I mean, in the story... He says Sir Eustace insults his wife with the vilest name a man can call a woman or something, but he doesn't say what he says. Here, we get some of that yeah. <laughs> really colorful dialogue, and I think it really works. And after he hits her, 
when he is taunting Crocker and he's like, yes, sir, come, sir, stand you there, sir, over the body of your yeah. dead. You know, I feel like yeah. that entire monologue is so great, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's invented by Trevor Bowen. and it's not Conan Doyle, but it's, it's great stuff. It really is great. It fits. Yeah. Yeah. I really like it. Yeah. Speaking of the Southern Cross office, I mean, this could be Jeremy, this could be the show, but there's this like high angle camera placement on Jeremy with the chessboard at the end of the scene. Yeah. And then Jeremy just puts his finger on a chess piece and just kind of hangs out there. <laughs> yeah. Again, like I wondered, was like, was this another misreference or something? But he's almost looking at camera at the beginning of it, like yeah. bewildered. And then he just turns away and puts his finger on the thing. It's like, it's a great little moment. It's interesting that the, the times when a director chooses to do a high angle yeah. on someone like that, you know, it, because it, it accentuates something, but it's never easy to figure out what it's accentuating to me red in that particular instance it's the chessboard of course but yeah but it's also sometimes just done on the actor to make them feel smaller or make them feel yeah. lessened in the, in the scene or something it's not something you see a lot of these days i have to say but it's it's neat yeah yeah i mean we've pretty much touched on all the other good points i had so moving into the bad I mean, again, there's so little bad. If I, ha- th- I think the worst bad note I have is the Foley sound when Brackenstall hits his wife. It's like it's like a pretty bad stock sound. It sounds like a bag of potatoes being punched. I just watched uh, Indiana Jones, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like if you haven't seen that in a while and you go and you watch Indiana Jones, you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot about the sound effects in this one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's what it sounds like in this episode. It, yeah. it, that's what I thought of. I thought of Indiana Jones. Yeah. So it's just it's just a, it could have been a little more subtle, but uh, yeah, it's fine. Right. I mean, really, the only other bad notes I have are things we talked about: the the painting kind of not looking like him, the the wires. Um, I don't know that I have anything else really. Oh, the wax. Yeah, we got to talk about the wax. Yeah. Probably most super fans have noticed this, but I, I mean, for those who haven't, it appears as though they created some kind of hardened wax or plastic pool of blood. Yeah, which they laid on top of the carpet, which I assume is because the real carpet of that house was being used and they couldn't stain it. Right. But I mean, and that's fine. It it could have worked, but sadly, when Sir Eustace dies, his head is like pushing up against the solid blood prop. Yeah. And it kind of moves it and flops it a bit. And it's just at the start of the shot, but I mean, it's not unforgivable and it's not terrible, but even before HD, I noticed this one. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's just unfortunate. I, it, it's just doubly unfortunate because it actually is kind of a cool blood splatter pattern they tried for. Well, I wondered if it was that or if it was um, in the story. He, they talk about, you know, his brains are all over the floor. Yeah. So I wondered if they were going for like a 3D. <laughs> like it wasn't blood. It was like goopy brain stuff. Yeah. Maybe. Even if they were just trying to keep it off the rug, like they could have just got a rug. And put it under, you know, put it over the other rug. Yeah. And then just bled all over that. But who knows? You never know with scheduling and yeah, it's it's a little upsetting. Yeah, that one's that one's tough. Well, we can talk about the Jeremy. I mean, we already pretty much covered most of his great stuff, but I mean some of it's worth revisiting. I mean, the hug with Lady Brackenstall. I mean, yeah. I love it. it it's great. I mean, it, again, it's a, it's another one of these single shots. You know, it's not super long or anything, but he he exits the hug and he walks across the room and his reaction is kind of like, I like the fact that his reaction is unbroken because it's almost like he's shocked, like stunned yeah. by this hug. He and, looks and startled. Yeah. And then kind of on the verge of disgust. Yeah. And he carries that over as he walks away like, well, I'm shell-shocked. Like, I don't know what just happened. Yeah. So I feel like they, they could have cut away, but it was a great choice that they didn't. So that was that was nice. Nice for Jeremy. Yeah. I think when they're outside, Holmes is writing the note for Inspector Hopkins, and then he just shouts, Chiselhurst Station, and like the carriage just takes off. (laughs) And Holmes is still on the complete other side. And like Edward Harbrick even looks like he's genuinely worried that he's not going to make it. But Jeremy just runs around and he just hops in. It's like, I wonder, I always wonder if that those kind of things are planned or not. But uh, he seems, you know, at home with jumping on and off of carriages throughout the, the whole series. So I wonder if it was. Yeah. I do really like the final sequence. When, when Holmes and Watson are just sitting around smoking and drinking and yeah. Holmes is smiling and giving his little humphs and his little little laughs and, you know, it ends on a big smile from the two friends. I mean, it's an extreme close-up. Yeah. But it is great. And I like the fact there's no music. I, I kind of wondered if there was no music because, once again, 
this entire sequence is shot on the boom mic from across the room, so it's very quiet. Yeah. You can barely hear the little things Holmes is, is saying and doing. Same with the shots of Crocker in there, too. Yeah, but then when you cut in on Watson in that last sequence and he has his final line and he says, it's just as well you are unique, Holmes, or whatever. I mean, it's 20 decibels louder <laughs> yeah. than the rest of the audio in that sequence. So, it, 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 you know, it's not maybe not perfect, but I really like it. I really like that ending sequence. Yeah, and it feels like one of the drawings. Yeah. Even if it isn't one. It feels like it was one. Lots of great stuff. Time for a vote. Who Who shall go first? You go first. All right. Well, I don't know what the popular opinion is on this one. I do tend to pull away from some of the later Peter Hammond episodes. Mm -hmm. But this one, I think, is spot on. I, I never... You know, as much as I had to say about it in this review, I, I never really noticed all the red or the reflections until much, much later. So I can't, I, I don't feel like it's heavy handed, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I love the performances. I love the script. I really love the romance aspect of it. I love the way it all feels so genuine. It, it does, it gets my heartstrings. I think Jeremy is great. Edward, a little wooden, but it's his first one. And there's nothing bad about his performance. I think he was just still finding out who he was going to be. Obviously, there's the wires. There's a, you know some technical flubs. But any negatives I have about it, they're just so minor. I, I'm Honestly, I'm tempted to give this one a 10. Mm. But I think the thing that holds me back is thinking about the other episodes you know, and how it stacks up against my favorite episodes that I would give an unhesitating 10. Right. I, I don't think I'm quite there. So I think I can, in good conscience, give this one a 9.8. Mm. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. I guess for me, I, I feel like when I think back on this episode, I enjoy it. I, I think about like a lot of our listeners have written in saying how much they love this episode and how much it makes them cry, how romantic it is. That's not really what I go in for for Holmes. Mm -hmm. You know, like I appreciate that this one is there, that it exists and this and that. But like you said, like when I think of my favorite episodes, this one isn't always up there. I think I would probably have to settle and I, I, I can never remember what my previous votes were, but I think I'd go for something around 9.5. That's respectable. It's still an A. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good score. I feel like people are going to think we're being soft on these episodes, but... They are very good, and we will be harsh soon. <laughs> We're still in the beginning. We're still at the ones that are great. Yeah. I agree with what you're saying, but I, I, I don't mind. I, I, these are almost all A's, in my opinion. Yeah. All right. Well, let's check in with Mrs. Hudson for a segment we like to call Mrs. Hudson's Housekeeping. Okay, well, I think we can... Just talk really quickly about what we've been up to the last month or so. Um, I feel like we're always <laughs> making excuses for why the show takes so long, but uh, long story short, Luke and I were invited to shoot Werner Herzog's next film. Yeah. By Mr. Herzog himself, which was pretty unexpected. I mean, we had worked with him in the past on a few projects, but he had need of a small but industrious crew to help out at the last minute to help him shoot a lot of footage very quickly, and so he decided to give us a call. So within a week or so of the invite, we were off on a two-week shoot across the United States with the great director himself. Yeah, heck of an honor. Yeah, not really a lot we can share about it yet, but no. <laughs> once it gets announced and is public, we'll certainly let you know more. I guess all we can really say is that it was an incredible experience. I know I learned a lot and worked harder than maybe I ever have, so... Yeah, it was wild. Yeah. And just to kind of hear, you know, from, from someone else, because you and I haven't worked with many other directors or photographers because we usually work with each other. Yeah. So it was nice to, be, you know, hear things like lens choices and lighting choices from someone as established as him. Yeah, it was quite an adventure. And uh, I'm sure we'll have more to say about it when the movie is out there. For sure. Another thing we've been working on in, in that time is capturing a lot of interviews with different cast and crew members from the show. So we will have a lot of stuff to share coming up. Yeah, lots of interesting stories. So um, we'll be happy to share those with you soon. And for anyone who's been asking uh, merch, I added it to our website. So if you go to SherlockPodcast.com, uh, there's a link to the merchandise. And so if you need a Dancing Men shirt or an I Am a Breton shirt, they are available. 
Yeah, and we did actually sell out for a while of our posters and relics kits, but they are back in stock, uh, so those are available to anyone looking to pick those up. All right, well, let's check out some listener telegrams. Today, we begin with quite a special letter, handwritten to us by the great lady herself, Miss June Wyndham Davies. She wrote, How good of you it was to air my bio before the Musgrave Ritual, one of my favorite shows. Despite Jeremy's awful illness, periods of great depression, and feelings of inadequacy, he was a great joy when on form. There is truly not a better depiction of Holmes anywhere. Fortunately, we had a great understanding. He once ran away during rehearsals, and nobody could find him. I was working on another series then, but I remembered that the Midland Hotel had some horses stabled in the back of the building. So I went down there, and that's where I found him, cradling in the back of the stall. He loved horses and wanted to be with them. We went for a long walk around Manchester, and I managed to dissuade him from returning to London. We bought some apples for the horses, and I walked him back to the studios. Thank you for the bio, which you read beautifully. I am very flattered. My sincere good wishes for you to succeed. Love, June. I get a little shaky reading that, to be honest. <laughs> it's great to hear from her, for sure. Yeah. And I think it's another story that just will make people love Jeremy even more, too. Yeah, and I mean, a little backstory probably is required there. Our collaborator, David Yule, mm -hmm. who is responsible for so many of the interviews we have released and are soon to release for the podcast, David has been in contact with June and... As much as we would be willing to drop everything and fly to France if it meant the opportunity to interview her about the series, yeah. she has respectfully declined to participate in an interview at this time for various reasons. But she took the time to send us this incredibly kind note, which yeah. you know was so generous of her to do. And I don't know, I, it's something I know I will always treasure. So, I mean, to say thank you, June, seems truly inadequate, but... June, if you are listening, we love you, and we hope that you are doing well. And anytime you feel like reminiscing about the show, you just let us know, and we'll be there. Definitely. Okay, well, our next telegram comes from friend of the show, Ian, who writes, Dear Breton Pod Leaders, <laughs> <laughs> That's us. I'm glad you are back, and saddened to hear of Michael Cox's death. I do not enjoy the Musgrave Ritual episode very much, and I don't like the edgy tone with the opening sex scene much, as it paints everyone involved in a very unlikable light. The episodes I really love tend to try to have some strong points of appeal in the clients and the connection between Holmes and their need for justice. This has no real justice, just boredom, drugs, and tawdry murder, and suicide. The acting and filmmaking is top-notch, but I just can't get involved in the people. Plus, I don't tend to enjoy the touches of horror and the macabre as much. Still, I am very much looking forward to the Abbey Grange, T.R. Bowen's second episode. Bowen is my favorite of the frequent writers. Thanks for such a great listen. Signed, Ian. Well, thanks, Ian. Um, it is interesting. We actually have a few emails <laughs> coming up in a similar vein it turns out that the Musgrave Ritual is not everyone's cup of tea. Mm. I do have to say, though, uh, you, your use of the word tawdry is perhaps the right word. I mean, it does make sense here. I can certainly see how that would drag it down uh, for some viewers. I guess I can embrace it, though, since, you know, it's just one episode. I think it gives a unique feeling. Yeah, it's unique. We're a sex-positive podcast. <laughs> But I, I could see how it, maybe it's not for everyone. So, you know, I get that. It's true, but it, it's followed up immediately by the most romantic episode. So sure, you get a little bit of everything. And I think, you know, everybody should have a little bit of something nasty on the side every once in a while. Sure, a little bit of nasty. <laughs> Good friend of the show, Mary, writes in to say, Normally, I agree with the two of you about everything. But although I enjoy this episode for itself, as a Holmesian, it rankles me a bit. 
The Holmes of the canon is actually very compassionate in his view of Musgrave, while in the Granada version, Holmes is a complete jerk to this really nice, rather gentle fellow. Musgrave is very shy and uncertain of himself, not worthy of such nastiness. I agree Musgrave is a jerk in the story to dismiss Brunton for snooping around, but for the most part, he seems to be rather decent to his servants and had a hard time of it in school. The Holmes in the books regards Musgrave as a friend. I don't think canon Holmes would get coked up the first night to visit, and in the books, Holmes never uses drugs when he's away from Baker Street. I think this is very much Jeremy as Holmes rather than Holmes. And while it's not a bad thing, I don't like the episode as much as others from this season. Michael Culver, however, is wonderful. You mentioned him on a horse, and he is near and dear to my heart, because I saw him on reruns as the stuffy Squire Armstrong in Black Beauty, a great 70s British TV show. So if you want to see Culver playing an actual stuffed shirt, this is a great example, although for some reason I adored his character as a kid. I also think the supporting cast of Ritual is great, so I do like seeing this episode when it pops up, but cringe during the cocaine, sleeping in the butler's bed, and all sorts of things, I don't think even an eccentric like Holmes of the canon would have done. Signed, Mary. Yeah, again, I I, I think that's all legit criticism. I think as Jeremy would himself say at some point, it's hard to know what works until you try it sometimes. I think that's all fair. And I think, you know, David Carson pointed out to us that this was kind of a setup for him ditching the drugs in a later episode. Right. So, I mean, I think... As a storyline, I think it was a good choice. And though, you know, I kind of disagree. I mean, obviously, because we've already said all this, but I do feel like even though Holmes might have considered this guy a friend, I think he gets bored at the commonplace. And so this guy being so normal and so common, maybe he was like, I'm just going to liven it up with some drugs. Like, sure. I could see that being true too. Like, he's uncomfortable in social settings. Yeah. And so he's just livening it up a little bit. Well, I think it all works, but it's it's unique. It's, you know, for me anyway, it's it's different and it doesn't stray too far from Conan Doyle's intentions. So, you know, it makes good television. It also kind of shows the habit side of drugs though, too, I think, yeah. you know, that it's it's not always convenient and kept at home. Right. But yeah, thanks Mary. It's uh, always good to hear from you. Yeah. We have another telegram also in response to the Musgrave ritual. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie writes in to say This episode is great, partly because it follows one of the key rules of Sherlock Holmes adaptations. It's always better with more Watson. (laughs) I especially like Hardwick's jovial mood with Cranky Holmes, his mischievous smile when he thinks of snooping through the old case box, his triumph with solving the final instruction and under, and his side eye at Musgrave after explaining about the personal equation. Mm Mm-hmm. I hope this episode makes you hesitate a little more before answering the question, who is the best Watson? Well, I don't know if it'll do that, but it, <laughs> it's it's hard to argue with any of that. I mean, but as we've said in the past, both gentlemen are indisputably great. I mean, for, for different reasons. Yeah. I myself, I, I just, I never like having to answer the question, who is the better Watson? Because, you know, even though I myself have asked it of others. Yeah. Just because they are both so grand, I mean, we're we're so lucky to have both. I mean, think think of that. What if they got someone else to replace David Burke? Mm-hmm. I mean, the choice of Watsons. I mean, I think it really significantly affects the tone of the adaptation. So, yeah, I couldn't be happier with both. I just I do think that had David Burke stayed, we would have seen him grow and age as a character, and their relationship as friends would have evolved and. You know, it's impossible to say what might have been, but I always just, I just feel slightly melancholy that we never got to see that happen. But yeah, and I think, like, as you said, it's like we've got an amazing replacement. But I do, I always think about um, auditions mm-hmm. and how different they are if you're an actor or if you're on the casting side. Right. And And normally, when an actor goes into an audition, they're thinking, how can I convince them that I'm the right person for this job? Whereas when you're on the casting side, you're just waiting for the right person to walk in. Right. And if David Burke walked in, to me, it would be like, he's the right guy. He just has everything yeah. in my mind of what of what Watson is. And if David Burke didn't walk in and Edward Hardwick walked in, he's so close right. <laughs> that you would be you would be ecstatic to find him. Yeah. But and, and honestly, you know, I, I said what I said about what could have been, but 
if that would have happened, if David Burke would have stayed, we would have missed out on Edward Hardwick. So, I mean, exactly. Yeah, wh- what can you say? They're, we got both. Yeah, they're both great. I'm, I'm glad it worked out how it did. The next telegram comes in from Andrew. He writes, Hi, Gus and Luke. Thank you so much for all of your hard work on the podcast. It's really a fascinating listen, and you seem to have found a very Holmesian way to present yours and our passion with an investigative spirit, a calm authority, and a real eye for detail. Well, thank you, Andrew. That's nice of you to say. Yeah. I've been a Holmes fan since I was a teenager when I read all the books and was just old enough to see the later Jeremy Brett episodes first airing when I was growing up. I found him captivating, and despite other pretenders to the crown, he will always be Sherlock Holmes for me. No one else is close. A common feeling, I know. After hearing you mention the audiobooks read by Edward Hardwick, I thought I'd see if you'd heard a series of audio recordings of the Holmes stories read by Robert Hardy in the early 1980s. Hardy, of course, went on to play Charles Augustus Milverton with suitable relish. When I first discovered Holmes, it was Robert Hardy's readings that I heard on cassettes from my local library. His readings are absolutely superb. His characterizations, his energy, his theatricality, and his incarnations of Holmes and Watson are, to my mind, the best out there. Certainly better than Hardwick, a great actor, but I would say not quite right for this task. And dare I say it, even better than Stephen Fry. Hardy's voice seems to belong in the world of Conan Doyle, and his readings have a dramatic quality about them that I think you would both really enjoy. I've been looking for them in some digital format for years, and, at last, in recent months, they have been reissued on the iTunes Store and, here in the UK, on Audible. I'm sure you could track them down, too. If you've heard them, I'd be really curious to know what you think, or, if they are waiting for you to discover them, I hope you'll like them, too. Looking forward to the Abbey Grange. By the way, I live in Brighton, nestling just below the Sussex Downs, a great place to keep bees and free the mind. All the best to both of you, Andrew. Well, Andrew, um, actually, I don't know about you, Luke, but I had not heard about these audiobooks until now. I have not, but better than Stephen Fry? Blasphemous. Well, I'm determined to give them a listen, so once we've had a chance, uh, we'll definitely report back, but um, that's a fantastic lead, so thank you for sharing that with everyone. Yeah. And speaking of audiobooks, some time back, we mentioned the cassette tapes that I had come across. We finally got around to digitizing these, uh, with some help from a very dear friend of ours whose name actually happens to be Mr. John Clay. Mm-hmm. Good friend of ours. But we have just added those to YouTube. So if you're interested in hearing the 1994 audiobooks for The Man with the Twisted Lip, The Musgrave Ritual, The Priory School, and The Second Stain, read by Michael Cochran, but with audio clips from the Granada series, do check out our YouTube channel for those. I should say, though, we posted those, and they were immediately flagged for copyright. Mm. We're not monetizing them, but they are not available to listen to in the UK or Germany. Mm. I'm sure that's just down to the rights they've negotiated, but yeah, unfortunately, we can't get around that. However, we posted them on our Patreon, and there are no restrictions. So if you happen to be a patron of ours, you can listen to them right now. Yeah, and they're they're interesting. I mean, uh, they're not dissimilar to our podcast in that it's an it's a narrator with a different script inserting clips from the Granada series. It really was a, an undertaking to get these put up because <laughs> they're old audio tapes. I don't know if they were always sped up in the way that they were, or if the tape shrunk because of age, or you know, I don't Probably. I don't know what, but yeah. they, they had to be digitally adjusted in terms of both speed and pitch <laughs> yeah. uh, you know they may or may not be totally perfect but um, they're close and they're um, you know they're, they're a fun little uh, series related bit to check out which frankly other than you know our main show appearing on our YouTube channel that's kind of what our YouTube channel has become is just kind of a little series related stuff that we can add um, if you if you decide you want to track down that stuff so yeah. it's possible youtube might crack down on us for the copyrighted material um i mean it's an out of print audiobook on cassette I, who knows but uh if you're interested in checking those out i'd say do so while the getting is good speaking of series related tidbits we did get a message from one of our listeners named mark williamson 
and he he sent us a bunch of pictures, which I'd like to post on our Twitter, and I, he's already given me permission to do so. But he's yeah. visited a number of the locations, and uh, he wrote saying, uh, "Today I was in Bowdoin, uh, where the Norwood Builder was filmed." And he says, "I was afraid I was mistaken over the church for Scandal Bohemia being on the same street, but here are some photos of the house, which another location site claims is the scene of the crime." And then he says, "The White House is next door," and I apologize for not being able to get closer to the actual house. A local resident told me it belongs to the pop star Morrissey, who guards hmm. his privacy. I wow. just thought that was a fun little tidbit. So which house is Morrissey's house? I'm not positive, because he says the White House is next door. Okay. And I apologize for not being able to get closer to the actual house because oh, it belongs I see. to Morrissey. I see. So okay. I, I think it means he lives in the actual house, which would be pretty wild. And then I wonder if he's a fan. And then yeah. I wonder if he wonders, why are these people taking a picture of my house? Right. But they, he doesn't know it's because of Sherlock. Yeah, and I think we have permission to share those photos, so hopefully we'll we'll get those up on Twitter soon and yeah. people can check those out. Yeah. Friend of the show, Claire, wrote in with a very thoughtful email. She says, Hi, Gus and Luke. Hi, Claire. I am such a fan of your podcast, as growing up my family was enthralled by Jeremy Brett's portrayal of Holmes. We used to rush to clear up our dinner plates and run to the telly to catch each episode from the very beginning as the music and titles were such a large part of the experience and still give me all the feels to this day. I have been musing for some time on the female perspective portrayed in Sherlock Holmes, but thought now would be the time to get my thoughts down in an email. I have been struck by the frequency in which the tales relate to women's experiences of crime. Take away the gloves, bustles, and veils of the Victorian era and many of these stories would be recognized by women the world over today. In The Solitary Cyclist and The Dancing Men, we see both forced marriage, or threat of it, and stalking. There is also the imprisonment and emotional abuse of Alice Rucastle. Subsequently, Miss Hunter experiences Mr. Rucastle's attitude flicking like a switch between generosity and good humor to both veiled and outright threats to that dear young lady, including throwing her to the mastiff. Such devices are used by abusers to this day to knock their victims off balance and make them doubt their own senses. Domestic violence and abuse features again in the speckled band. Miss Stoner captures the essence of why many abuse victims stay with their abusers. Not only is she financially dependent on her stepfather until she marries, but he is the only father she has ever known. He may be a brute, but she has no one else to love. Abby Grange may well have the worst fake blood in the history of TV, but as a story of domestic violence and abuse, it is chilling. As soon as we discover that Lady Brackenstall's dog has been killed, we know exactly the character of her husband. He is a man sending a clear message. I can do anything I like. I can destroy everything you love, and I will. The next time you displease me, maybe I will destroy you. So, are all these crimes used merely to cast women in the role of victim and allow a heroic Holmes and Watson to come to their rescue? A traditional damsel in distress story? Perhaps. Yet, many of the Sherlock stories go beyond the crimes where a woman happens to be a victim and explore those where women are victims because they are women. Perhaps Conan Doyle just wrote what he saw, but with a modern eye, these stories expose a society whose inbuilt structures make women vulnerable. I feel that these stories, at least in the Granada retelling, resonate with women and how this fear is intensified by how trapped they are by these rules imposed on them by society, how reliant they are on the men around them being good men, and if they aren't good men, they rely on other good men standing up and saying, no, that's not acceptable. What is also interesting is that, despite Holmes's low opinion of women, he doesn't appear to blame them for their victimhood. He recognizes the danger in the low whistle, the following cyclist, the cut lock of chestnut hair, and yet does not demand that the female victim make themselves homeless and jobless in order to escape from danger. Instead, he fights to ensure that criminals are stopped and that, whatever the law says, evil is punished and good, rewarded, and women are freed from cruelty. In The Solitary Cyclist, a forced marriage is no marriage, 
despite what the license and the clergyman say, and in the Abbey Grange, he allows the killer of a violent, abusive husband to avoid arrest and trial. He is confident that however society changes, the moral argument will remain the same and win out. These are just my thoughts on how nuanced some of the stories are when it comes to the threats facing women. It's not all jewel thieves, street fights, forgeries, and international intrigue. Keep churning out the podcasts. They are adding much joy to these restricted and worrying times we live in. Regards, Claire. Well, thank you, Claire. I mean, what an insightful note. I mean, obviously, we now enjoy the benefit of time and the yeah. historical lens, I guess, through which we can look back on these tales. But I don't know, as a guy, I have often wondered what the female perspective on the canon has been over the decades. So I, th- I think this is a great way to look at this. I mean, I sometimes have worried in the past that there is a bit of a damsel in distress element to these tales that you know, could find itself sitting on the wrong side of more modern sensibilities. but That's true, but I think as she points out, it's the behavior is pretty typical and predictable and right. not based in any decade or even century. True. I, I don't think you could necessarily consider Doyle a feminist, but for the time, sure. I mean, I think he, you know, the approach to these stories was possibly more measured and considered, you know, exploring those details and, and what it was like to be a woman rather than just there's a damsel in distress, we go and save her. It's like, we do go deeper. Yeah. And, you know, maybe Holmes isn't so emotionally engaged, but he is dedicated to stopping evil. And in terms of, you know, Conan Doyle's point of view, I guess, whenever I read anything older, I try to look at it in the context of history. You know, I, I don't look, I don't just go looking for negatives. I, I you know, I look for positives and, and not just with Holmes, but in all forms of drama. But I think that's important because I think, Right now, especially, you know, we're canceling a lot of older authors and yeah. artists and things like that, which, you know, maybe some of them deserve it. But I think at the same time, you almost have to look for the good because it was really easy to look for the bad back then because we weren't that morally advanced back then. So right. it, I think if you find something good, you should embrace it. Actually, in the annotations, I believe in the Klinger book, there is a mention of the fact that Conan Doyle, you know, he grew up in a certain household and, you know, ha- had certain experiences. Um, and so he was frankly very critical of the divorce laws of that time mm-hmm. and how it was incredibly difficult. I mean, it, it was right around this time that divorce was even state sanctioned. Like it was church sanctioned prior to that. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to go before. And, and, and frankly, it was just an excuse for men to divorce their wives if they had been adulterous. It, was, it wasn't yeah. like the women had any rights in the divorce uh, situation. So in this story, if you read the actual text, Lady Brackenstall makes a comment about the deplorable divorce laws of England. Right. And that was kind of a jab that Arthur Conan Doyle was making because of his own kind of political uh, views. But I think Conan Doyle definitely deserves to come out on the right side of of the historical lens. Right, you know? because the fact that it's in the story at all is him saying it. Right. You know, he's imposing his own politics into the story. Yeah, and I think it's it's um, it's um it's great stuff, Claire. Thanks again for, for writing in. One last telegram today, I think. A listener and quite a fantastic journalist from Amsterdam, Mark G. Baker, sent us a very nice letter. He wrote, the Adventure of the Two Holwerdas. <laughs> Dear fellow Jeremites, it is my prerogative to compliment you on your excellent Sherlockian podcast, upon which I stumbled late last year. It is an absolute treat to revisit the Granada series, and I have made it my habit to listen to your most exquisite insights prior to watching another episode. As a seasoned journalist, I take pride in my own eye for detail but it seems you have raised the bar for dissecting minutia to a whole new level. I am convinced, were Mr. Sherlock Holmes himself around today, he would be impressed with your powers of deduction. I would hardly have guessed one could deliberate, to take a hypothetical example, something along the lines of, if you listen closely, you will find that the meow of the tabby Persian in the background at the end of scene 22 of the retired colorman was added afterwards and is, in fact, the meow of a grey British (laughs) shorthair. Capital, my dear sirs, capital. While on the subject of episodes never made, when I turn to the original stories, say Black Peter, 
I see before my very eyes Jeremy Brett in Allardyce's back shop, stabbing the dead pig with his barbed-headed spear, rolled up shirt sleeves and all. Brett, not the pig. <laughs> and turning the pages of his last bow, I have to check whether I actually heard Edward Hardwick say, I think not, Holmes. It is very warm. I must have been around 12 years of age when I first read the stories, starting with Dutch translations and switching to English soon after. As nutritious for the mind as it may be to read Sartre or Camus, there is no greater literary satisfaction than sitting by a fireplace with a cat on one's lap, a glass of port within reach, engrossed in those interesting little problems which the complex life of London so plentifully presents. If only I had a fireplace and a cat. Once the Granada series aired in Holland, subtitled, not dubbed, thank goodness, I was absolutely mesmerized by Brett's performance. Here was Holmes, exactly as I had envisioned him. It was as if someone had secretly peeked into my imagination and brought the consulting detective to the screen. I have fond memories of watching the series with my mother. I must have been 14 or something at the time. Much to my delight, I saw through Brett's sailor disguise in the sign of four. My mother failed to do so. She passed away the same year as Jeremy Brett, but I have no doubt she would have been rather impressed with the expertise you gentlemen display. It is reassuring to know that one is not alone in one's appreciation of Brett's accomplishments. But let us not forget the string of other astonishing actors involved. Eric Porter, Colin Jevons, Charles Gray, my word, the list is endless. Robert Hardy, for instance, who at the time I only knew as the good country doctor from All Creatures Great and Small. What a fantastically vile Charles Augustus Milverton he made. Or Joss Ackland as the sinister Mr. Rucastle. When I first watched The Copper Beaches, he scared the living daylights out of me. He still does, actually. And indeed, I may have found the solution to the mystery of who can be considered the better Dr. Watson. Edward Hardwick does the best Hardwickian Watson, and in turn, David Burke does the best Burkean. <laughs> Problem solved. There you go. Yeah. Praise be to the entire crew, in fact. Costumes, set dressing, locations, props and music, everything is just down to a T. As appealing as Mr. Cumberbatch may be to a younger generation, and rightfully so, I do not think we will ever see more brilliant adaptations of the canon than those with Mr. Jeremy Brett. Do I not have any reservations? Well, the Eligible Bachelor episode went off the rails completely, if I may be so bold. Call me a purist, but it was like watching an egg dance during Hamlet's soliloquy. One supposes the scriptwriters indulged in a 7% solution in this case, but luckily this proved to be one of the few exceptions. Righto, I fear that by now I have taken up too much of your time. Keeping in mind my favorite line from the canon, more sober men, as you may guess, than when they started, it is time for a snifter. My compliments once more for your spiffy work. And might I conclude in remarking that a posthumous BAFTA for Jeremy Brett would right a great wrong. Kind regards, Mark Baker. Post scriptum number one, regarding your surname, Holwerda, am I correct in assuming that you gentlemen are of Frisian lineage? I'll pause right there to say you are in fact correct, sir. Yes, and uh, we actually didn't know too much about our own lineage until <laughs> not too long ago, but it turns out that yes, indeed, our name was a Frisian password at one point uh, to get into a hidden village somewhere in Friesland. Post scriptum number two, a little bonus. And uh, Mark offers up a few limericks here. Traveling through time isn't real. I'm sorry if that's how you feel. The whole word of bros in their podcast, it shows, will take you through time with great zeal. <laughs> and now that we're at it, here's another limerick. Though many portrayed him with zest, like Rathbone, Gillette, and the rest, I say unto thee, no doubt can there be, that Jeremy's Holmes is the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can we say? Thank you so much, Mark. I mean, yeah. uh, both uh, you know, for your generous uh, reminiscences and your excellent contributions to the canon of Sherlockian limericks. 
the line I always think of when someone tells us we overanalyze it is, I thought I'd squeeze it dry, Mr. Holmes, but I see there was some left still after all. Oh yes, Mr. Freddie Jones. It's a it's a great it's a great sequence. I, I have to say, Michael Cox didn't love what Freddie Jones did with that part, but we're <laughs> we're a long ways away from getting to that, so we'll get there eventually. And we will defend him to the hilt. That's true. We love us some Freddie Jones. <laughs> okay, well, before we hit the road, we have one more limerick from Mr. Baker, and it's apropos of the episode we just covered. So um, we'll leave you with this. His lordship's demise was a shocker. The wife nearly went off her rocker. But once we had heard her accuse three of murder, it turned out it was Captain Crocker. (laughs) Excellent. Nice little Abbey Grange limerick for the road. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to all of our listeners for your continued support. As always, you can find us on the web at twitter.com slash sherlockpod. We are on YouTube as well. And please do send any thoughts and feedback to contact at sherlockpodcast.com. We greatly appreciate your telegrams. We also continue to add additional bonus content to our Patreon page. So please do consider joining us there at patreon.com slash sherlockpodcast. And to all of our existing patrons, we thank you for sticking with us. The next episode is one that requires no fanfare. It's quite simply a classic. I hope you'll join us next time when we encounter the man with the twisted lip. Until then... <laughs>